I would say there is no area in accessibility as interesting as board games. And the more that we make things accessible, the more we benefit from it. Accessibility helps everybody under different kinds of circumstances. I'm an associate professor here. I teach mostly on our game design and technology program. And for the past 10-ish or so years, I've mostly been interested in the topic of accessibility in games, as in how do we make games more playable for people who have disabilities or more people who have sort of complex interaction needs. So the thing that made me interested, uh, I did my PhD at Dundee University uh, in 2008. And really, I could not have cared less about the topic of accessibility when I started. And I was always hoping that the accessibility side of it could be sort of put to the side because the, the idea was to find uh, technology to help an older workforce. And it turned out that my supervisors kind of noticed that and they had this conversation with me, which was basically, well, you seem to think accessibility is easy. Imagine making a piece of software and you think that's sort of complex because my, my background is software engineering. Uh, imagine how difficult it is to make a piece of software that everybody can use. And from that point on, I started to see it as like a, a difficulty multiplier on everything. And, and from that point, I sort of realized that actually this, make, this doesn't make things less interesting to do. It makes things more interesting to do. It makes it more, more of a challenge to actually accomplish anything uh, if you're also taking into account people who don't have the, the default expectations of what we expect people to do with the system. So I, th I think this is actually a common issue, which is people don't often see why accessibility is particularly interesting. And I sort of talk to people about this as in, you know, once upon a time audiobooks were called books on tape for the blind, but we all listen to audiobooks. You know, predictive text was originally something that came about to help people with uh, mobility disorders, to be able to send messages uh, to people. And now we're all sort of plagued by vaguely competent predictive text. Uh, and you sort of see that when it comes to accessible technology in general. When we talk about technology that's designed for people with disabilities, it's always presented in a, in a medical term. Uh, but, you know, I, I wear glasses and glasses are fashion uh, accessory now. And one of my go-to examples of this is, if you've ever tried to type a text on a vast traffic tram, then what you'll tend to find is you, know, you type it, you hand heads, heads, you can type it, and then, because it's just not an easy thing to do. The accessibility tools that help you do that are largely the same as the accessibility tools for someone with Parkinson's or for some kind of gross motor control issues. So we all benefit from the same kind of things. So it, it, this is phrased as possibly the most academic way it possibly could be for what is a relatively simple idea. And it's the extraordinary people in ordinary circumstances, so people with disabilities in everyday life, have many of the same needs as ordinary people in extraordinary circumstances. So everybody, when you're just doing things that are a little bit unusual. I was getting quite into board games. Uh, I'd watched a there was a YouTube series like a few years ago called Tabletop, which was with Will Wheaton, who was Wesley Crusher in Star Trek. And I watched a few episodes and I thought, actually, this is kind of cool. And it was sort of coincided with a time where I was getting really burned out with video games because I was thinking, so what, what's coming out? Call of Duty, whatever, FIFA, whatever, a whole bunch of basketball games. Where's all the innovation in gaming? And so I bought a few of these modern board games and played a few of them and it was a case of, oh, so this is where all the innovation has been going. So as I played these, I sort of said, okay, I'm gonna buy some more of these and play some more and play some more. And eventually I had like a, a fairly embarrassingly large shelf of them. And I looked at it and I thought, I need to do something with this. It makes me feel more like a, a grown up. <laughs> and I thought, well, this is my research interest, accessibility in games, board games. I'll I'll analyze maybe four or five of them from the perspective of accessibility. I'll write a paper and then I'll never forget how I think about it again. And then it went from a research notion to a research interest to a full-blown research obsession. My earliest memory, my very first memories of a video game. What, it, what is a video game? It's a controller. It's some kind of display. If you can make an accessible controller, you're like 50, 60, 70 percent of the way to making all games accessible. The thing about a board game is there is no such thing as a board game interface. They all have different components and they all use those components in different ways. Every single board game is a brand new puzzle to solve. And that's what makes it sort of so 
incredibly interesting from, from an interface perspective. So it's a challenge from how do we make a game accessible, but also how do we make it accessible while not destroying the design or the fun? So the, the book comes from what was basically a, a research blog I've been running since 2016, uh, a blog called Meeple Like Us. And that was sort of where I started putting my, my research notes. Uh, just I thought I'll put them up for the public and people might be interested in it. It turned out quite a few people were. But what I was mostly looking at was take a game like Dexit, break it down into all these different kinds of accessibility categories, and then come up with a rough grade so that people could know, is this a strong prospect if you want to, if you have like, for example, uh, motor issues, is this a game you might want to play? If you have cognitive issues, is this a game that's playable? And it's never been my intention to say to people, you can't play these games, but to say, this, this is where I think you're gonna have an easier job than you are with these ones. So I looked at maybe 200, 220-ish games in the end for this. But one thing that people kept saying to me was, how does this help me make an accessible game? Because you've got all these design suggestions, but they're spread over like 200 case studies. The book is the site, but turned inside out. As in, what are all the, the sort of accessibility insights uh, that, that six years, seven years, eight years of this work have, have brought about? and put into what I hope is actionable guidance for people who do want to make more accessible board games. I also believe, as, as part of this accessibility work, that it's not just the things that we normally think of. It's not just you know, people with uh, vision issues or hearing issues. Representation is an accessibility issue. Uh, there was a website a few years ago that did uh, sort of a tongue-in-cheek article, and they looked at sort of like the top 100 games on a website called Board Game Geek, which is like the the place where all the, the board game geeks hang out. Uh, and what they basically found out was that at the time you were more likely to see a sheep on the cover of a video game, that, uh, on a board game, than you were to see a woman. And if you are a young woman going into a board game shop and all you see is middle-aged white men staring back at you, I think it's easy for you to look at that and say, well, this isn't a hobby for me. <laughs> this, is, this is clearly a hobby for other people. Uh, so I think things like representation and diversity and such are, are important accessibility factors. So I started looking for positions in Europe and I saw this position in Sweden. And I thought, I've heard very, very good things about Sweden. And a friend of mine who had gone from Scotland to uh, KTH, and he was so enthusiastic about it that I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll apply and see what happens. Uh, and, you know, went through the process and, and ended up here and yeah, absolutely do not regret it. So I'm of the belief that there are too many games out there. <laughs> there are too many board games, too many video games, too many TV shows, too many Marvel movies in particular. Uh, so when it comes to sort of like, do I feel like I want to make a board game? Yes, am I going to? Probably not. I don't think it's a thing, like, unless I was going to make something extraordinary. Like, if there was an idea in my head, I thought, this is the, the best idea anybody's ever had for a board game, I might. 